So what have you learned from doing the course? You're doing a course right now on, on RAG, which is really cool. I'm enjoying it. But I'm curious, yeah, what are you learning? I, I feel the most arrogant thing I'll say. I was more right than I thought. <laughs> what do you mean? The premise of the course was that there are these two biases that I think every team has, right? There's like the absence bias and the intervention bias. And basically the absence bias just says, you don't really think about what you can't see right away. And so people see the generation of a language model. So everyone thinks, oh, I need the generation to be better. And everyone doesn't see like the retrieval because it, it's hard to measure position and recall. It's hard to get gold labels. And so the big mistake is everyone just thinks that generation works and you got to evaluate generation rather than evaluating the information retrieval bit. And then the second bit around intervention bias is just this idea that you want to feel in control of what you're building. And again, the things they end up trying to intervene on is the generation. They want to feel good about having factuality evals from a library, right? And if that runs, then I'll be half satisfied. But very few people are actually thinking about recall. What we basically realized was, oh, the ability to find the right tools in a RAG agent is a precision recall problem, right? Why do you think that people don't think about recall when even if they're focused on generation, like how can you generate the right answer if the context, the right context is not given to the language model for it. Won't, won't they notice that? Yeah, but I think that just boils down to the absence of blindness, right? We aren't looking at every single text chunk that is being returned. We don't see that, right? We see a question is being submitted, a spinner, and then text comes out. I, I think that's even traces. And so when you just think of it, when people are looking at these problems, if you demo the CEO and the answer is not good, you just say well, the answer wasn't good, right? The CEO can't really make a statement that says, oh, it doesn't seem like it found the right part in this PDF that I somehow know about. Because then the question was like, was this even in the context? Very few people are looking at that, right? Like most people I know would just say, oh, I played around with the number of chunks I put in my prompt and it has somehow impacted my factuality metric. And so if K is higher, factuality is higher, right? And then I come back to say, okay, hold up. Is factuality sensitive to the context length? Is that really what we're measuring? that's one thing. And again, it's just hard to come up with that data. Once we have synthetic data, let's blend in user data. And once we have too much data, let's segment it and then solve each problem as a, as a slice of that segment. Right. But everything just comes back down to precision recall and search. So how do you like dig inside? Like, how do you get, like, how do you break it down in a way that people can learn it? even go beyond what you take for granted. Is there, I struggle with that sometimes. I'm like, uh, cause frankly, I'm like, okay, look at the data. And then they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, just let's look at it. And we look at it and we find the problem. We like, look at the trace. My first thought was, I definitely agree. I think when I was building up this course, I was like, oh man, this is too obvious. Half the cohorts can just refund their money. Cause oh, I know what recall is. Obviously I have these data sets, but then you realize no client I've ever worked with had recall metrics before I started. And so I, I had to convince myself of it. I think the bigger call out though, is when we both say, look at our data, we're not being systematic enough. And as a result, I think it really hints to the fact that we have not thought hard enough about the problem because we are the, like the physics professor. And so part of it is like, okay, this is actually our, like our only job is to systematize what it means to look at data. And so maybe we can through inversion, figure out what it means. Okay. What does it mean to not look at the data correctly? And the, the process I've, I've arrived at is this idea of, okay, first we need feedback labels so we can group by positive and negative feedback. We can look at per question, what is the satisfaction? What per question, what is the recall? Then we need to be more abstract. So now we have to start thinking about clustering methods. And so then we have to start thinking about segmentation is easy to explain. If you run a marketing campaign and you, it was 80% effective, hard to know what to do next. But if you find that. 90% of the lift came from the specific segment of college graduates between this age and this zip code. Now you have an actionable step, right? Now you can, oh, let's go target those people. Let's go buy some billboards or bus stop ads, right? Because we now know what to target. And so it's okay. There's these metrics we want to group by. We're going to identify segments. Then once we have segments, maybe we can think about different ways of organizing that better. Maybe we can start thinking about classification. If we can classify these segments, now we can think about monitor, right? If we have an other topic, maybe that other class can help us think about drift, right? Let's have some rules and policies in place that says if the other class is greater than 10%, we have to go rerun this analysis. 
And now the assembly line is set up, right? Now there's instructions that I can give to different people on the team. Like you need to improve tool recall. You need to improve the recall of this tool. You need to improve our question type classifier and both the monitoring. And you need to set up like a data dog alert that says if other percentage greater than 10%, you need to post a message on Slack. Now those things are the things I can like leave behind. That's I think how- there's some aspects of maybe it requires, I try to explain it to some friends. It's like being handy, like being mm-hmm. like something breaks in your house. See, like if you fix enough things in your house, you can get an intuition, like how to troubleshoot some kind of piece of hardware or whatever, right? Like you can get a sense of it. I think mm-hmm. data is like that, but maybe it's the case like the systematic instruction needs to be on like very specific things. Like yeah. this is how you debug something when this thing happens, when that thing happens, yeah, I need to pay attention. Yeah. Like we need to do a better job of making the unconscious conscious. Yeah. But, and, and that's the attempt that I'm doing with the course is going, okay, like how right am I? Where are these assumptions wrong? Where can more clarification come in? Cause ideally you can just come into a, a business, lay down these fi- like frameworks and foundations and go, these are the processes you got to fill out. Here are the instructions for each one, and then you can leave. I think all great businesses are businesses built off of just an extensive library of standard operating procedures. Right. If you go to, if you work at McDonald's, you don't have to figure anything out. Like everything is documented. Everything is written down. This is how you operate like this machine and that machine. And this is what happens when this breaks and that breaks. And that's how you let someone who's 19 years old come into the establishment and not hurt productivity by 50%. And I think we, us specifically, our role in the ecosystem is to actually try to describe what that looks like. I think the goal to do the cohort in February, like I think I really want to like, the goal is to do one more big company that is like retrieval specific, come up with a little bit more case studies, and then try to do the cohort maybe two or three times in, in 2025. I really want to just improve the slides and make sure we have good examples and not just rush into rerunning it rather than making sure it's high quality. I think the content will age well because it is the stuff I did in 2020. Yeah, no, I think it's pretty timeless. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. What have you, have you been learning anything about your consulting practice? Like how you do consulting, how you sell projects? Oh yeah. We've been talking about this a bunch. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think we talked about this on Slack, but I'm I'm thinking about writing like a small ebook on like how to do AI consulting. I think I, I just had. I've had too many dinners where I just start ranting about the same notions and like pricing and like trading your time for money and how it's a trap. And so I think the next thing I'm going to figure out how to do is systematize that, right? Like a blog post I'm working on today is just like why you should take like tons of free calls and how you can leverage that time spent. And then the the header is just like, if they're not paying for the call, they're the product and you should use this material to write content to address certain pains and then use that as your content flywheel and then allow yourself to like grow an audience. And so the goal is just to come up with seven, eight blog posts, put them into a little ebook. And again, just practice marketing. Cause I think it's been really fun. I think you agree, right? I think the sales and marketing process is really fun now that the, the machine learning things are much more intuitive. Yeah. I think it's one of the most important things to focus on if you're running a business, especially your technical, probably something you ignored most of your life, probably like writing code and stuff. It's actually, we've been dissuaded from even going anywhere near that. There's an engineering culture. We like look down upon sales and marketing and whatever, anything that's not code in second class. So it's like a mind, you have to do it. It's a little bit of a mind shift. Yeah. But no, it, it's good to be on the other side of that. I think Landon had a question, value-based pricing, not time and materials. I can go on this rant a little bit. If you look at a hotel and like the complex of the hotel, the people who are paid like the least is the staff and the bricklayers, and they are definitely being paid by their time. But like the investors of the hotel, the people who, like the, the real estate developers, they're just being paid percentages of the value of the land or the revenue of the business. Right. And so there's a hierarchy of basically trading your time for money versus learning how to manage people's time, learning to attract talent and vet people who can, you can hire. At the highest level, you're basically just allocating capital, right? Like the investor, like a real estate investor is just looking at an Excel spreadsheet going like these buildings might make the money back. So if I give them a hundred million, I'll make 180 million. So that's my margin. Great. I would really like to get to value-based pricing for AI projects, but often I struggle because I think I would have to say no to lots of projects because frankly, lots of people don't have any connection, any kind of legitimate 
they're just too far away from articulating any value. Maybe the value is more psychological or like more curiosity, which is certain value, but it's hard to track. Um, yeah, there's this one book that I just read recently where it's like, okay, there's like the subjective value theory, right? Where value is going to be described by the incremental revenue you can generate, the cost savings, revenue gain, and emotional contribution. And I think what we're realizing is the base products, like the worst products, are the ones that only sell on cost reduction. All you can return for them is the max of all their expenses, which for a business, my business expenses is like 20K a month. That's exactly what people call center automation. Like you can try to sell the upside revenue generation, but honestly, in most cases, especially customer service, people just look at it as a cost center. Exactly. And so I think the part that feels gross to me in this wave of things is okay. Cost reduction is like the worst thing to sell on because it is the lowest value. I think better projects are the ones where, and this is going to be so successful. You're going to be spending twice as much money. And that's a good thing. If someone came to me and said, Hey, Jason, I have an ad where if you spend a dollar on this ad, you'll make $12. My question stopped becoming, it just becomes how much money can I put in this ad until that sure. ratio goes to one. I'm paying this agency $2,000 a month for this. ad. Like I want to spend $10,000 in this ad. Because this ad's going to make me so much more money. And so there's that upside. So I think the, the best products are doing a lot more revenue generation, in particular, allowing companies to spend more money. And then lastly, I think there's very the- few AI, AI projects that can articulate that story. Like most of it yeah. that I'm seeing is like very emotional based value. Yeah. I think a lot of the, a lot of the companies I've seen right now say, oh, if you pay your associates this much, we can take a, we can take a percentage of that off your plate. But ideally, I'm selling a business where I can say, hey, if you use our like AI due diligence system, you're going to be able to allocate twice as much capital because you can just process way more deal flow. And then you're alluding to this idea of, okay, you may not have missed an additional deal because you didn't have the time to talk to these younger founders, right? Maybe you only had enough resources to focus on second time founders. And now because of AI, you can also process some percentage of folks that you would not have time for. Maybe there's some diamonds in the rough. And so you're capturing that. Go from back office automation, I think, to getting someone to agree to pay you a percentage of sales. Exactly. Yeah. You were like automating something in the sales process, for sure. But in the sales process, the, the best thing that I've really tried to convey is all salespeople have the number of deals, like have really concrete metrics of the number of deals they get the expected value of those deals and the conversion rate. And so you can actually calculate for your bottom half, if those metrics were average, what additional like revenue could you gain? So I I think there is something there of like, okay, if we just made your like bottom 50 percentile sales folks have average metrics, what would that number be? I think that's still a convincing thing of, okay, now you're just not losing. You don't have to fire the person. You can just make them average. And just raising the floor. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so can, you, can we do that a little bit more? And are there good formulas for trying to figure out what that is worth to somebody? I think that's interesting. But yeah, I, I think so much of it right now is like emotional contribution. Like the executive just wants Gen AI on their PowerPoint because that's going to get them promotion. I think most people that talk to me about Gen AI, it's, oh, we just want you on the team. And if we have you on the team, we'll be able to attract a different investor. We'll be able to raise at a higher multiple if we have a head of AI. If you could help us get there, that'd be great. But I think... What I've learned is those are the kind of projects you should avoid. Saying no is can be hard, especially if the client is interesting or the work is interesting in some other dimension. You have to be like honest with yourself. A lot of it is just trying to figure out like what actually is the outcome they're trying to drive. We've basically learned that we should be selling to to people in pain, people who are suffering. I want to solve so many problems with money, right? My only limiting factor is I just can't find the right people. But I think a lot of these companies are in pain, but they're like, it's most of a FOMO pain versus like a real pain. Like the more I'm trying to get other people to help me make more money, the more I'm like, man, I am so willing to pay. Like, how do you think that might play out in your book about consulting, becoming AI, like do, becoming an AI consultant? On one hand, yeah, it's like lucrative. You can certainly make a lot of money and all these other benefits of like freedom, but moving more towards value-based consulting and all that, I feel like it's challenged in this specific niche yeah. uh, with AI and whatnot. Hey, I left my like $150,000 job as a data scientist and I tried to do AI consulting and I stopped in six months. Let me tell you why. And a lot of it, just, they just thought 
it would be easy money. Six months right? is not long enough at all for to do anything. Like, yeah, like to try for the first six months of my consulting, I was working like yeah. 90 hours. I was working like 90 hours a week and writing three blog posts a, a, a week and taking like calls from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Only now am I working like three hours a week. That was like nine months. Oh, yeah. You have to this. Yeah. Six months doesn't make sense. But I think the issue is people do it because they think it's like easy money. Like someone messaged me. It's oh, like, how can I get to become an advisor as quickly as possible? And I was like, that's crazy. I think when people say, I want to become a consultant and they have a job, I'm like, no, you don't. You need to be because... dumb enough to believe it. You need to be dumb enough to actually do it, then smart enough to actually succeed. Yeah, you have to like be pretty, you have to be like, oh, okay, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to try it. I think if you do a well, good job, like yeah. it is pretty, if you are an experienced machine learning engineer, to make as much money as you did before and work less in the medium term for the first five months it's going to be way worse but you're just like sure. planting the seeds but after that i think it's great because i finally reap the rewards but yeah I, I think unless someone has already quit their job it's very hard to take them seriously but i think if you've been working in tech for four or five years like the time it will take to go, to have someone go to maybe like 10 20 thousand dollars a year is, is is pretty reasonable a month you mean yeah I mean, one month is a, gr a really great point, which is consulting is a weird job where the more you do it, the more you're bad at it. I agree so much. I don't know if Hamel, if you have any thoughts on this, but this almost hurts my feelings. No, totally. It's like any business, maybe in a way you have different problems as you progress. Like at first you have a marketing problem. No one knows about it. Then at some point you have a sales problem. Okay. People know about you, but how do you close deals? Yeah. And then maybe at some point you're like, okay, you are the bottleneck. Like. You can only do so much. Problem. How do you hire people? Where are you going to get these people from? Whatever. How do you do it? Et cetera. What is the then right you're balance? Bad at copywriting, yeah. right? Then you're bad at writing copy. Then you're bad at like hiring. Then you're bad at pricing or convincing other people to work with you on these projects. You're just always bad at something. Like the moment you figure something out, you're just bad at the next thing. And then there's like even more meta than that. It's like, should you even be doing consulting? Should you be building a product? Should you be doing courses? Should you be doing both? Whatever. How does it all? Yeah. It's like a exploratory process. Yeah. I don't know about you. I definitely don't see myself doing consulting. I think if I've been doing consulting for almost like three years, it would be like really depressing because I think it's like pretty like lonely. Like I'm glad that, you know, I know people like you and Eugene, where we can still talk about this kind of stuff. I generally think it's like pretty lonely. And even now, because of the way we've built our businesses, if I just get in a car accident and I can't like move my mouth, <laughs> I don't make no money. Yeah, so, so even if you get sick, maybe, or if you get sick enough, you know, whatever. Yeah, like I remember after the engineering conference, I was like, oh, like I want to just take the week off and just refund, <laughs> refund these like calls because I just want to lay down. And so I'm also getting a little bit of a glimpse of what it means to be a founder, like why it makes sense to have a co-founder, what that looks like, a lot of things. Yeah, I think it's only different from being a VC backed founder in the sense that everything is now your fault. <laughs> I really like that part. I like that everything is my fault. It gives me a reason to learn stuff that would just be like, that's not my problem or something. Yeah. Like sales is my problem. So I have a, like an incentive to learn it and not be stupid. I'm still stupid, but okay. I still have some, and now when I read something about sales, it like sticks a lot more because I'm making the mistake. I'm like, oh, I made that dumb mistake like yesterday or whatever. Yeah. I also think this is, this is silly too, but the more I understand sales and marketing and like value-based pricing, the more I am open to paying for things. Like now like I totally see why executives go to these like $4,000 like weekend workshops because the leverage becomes so high, right? So oh, if yeah. you have better copywriting and you own a business and you're responsible for the revenue of that business, the most expensive part of a five day, a five hour, $5,000 workshop is the fact that it's a weekend of your time. And yeah, so, yeah, I bought 100%. like a pricing book for four hundred dollars. I'm like, oh, I want to make ten thousand dollars extra next month from this. And then you're like, oh, totally. those are the people I need to sell to people who actually understand that value. Because I think if you work for like first time founder out of out of college, that hasn't clicked for them yet, and they're just like, oh, how much time is it going to take? Whereas, I think the more you realize that like, your compensation is a function of how much accountability you have over the outcome. If I went to somebody and said, oh, instead of having a designer for the book and a, and a landing page, someone just said, I will be responsible for all of this. Pay me when the book launches. Well, I'm willing to pay so much for that because that takes so much off my plate.
And so it's also yeah. just useful to think about those mindset shifts. I feel the same way about consulting. Like, I think consulting makes me feel a certain way about jobs. I'm like, oh my God, like jobs, I'm getting really taken advantage of in most jobs, like economically, which is what it's designed to be that way. Consulting is less so, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, of course, like if you do it correctly, but then after doing the course, then you realize how low leverage even consulting is compared to a product, obviously, like mm -hmm. it's just a totally different, and then makes me feel differently about even consulting. Consulting is not as exciting as having products, even knowledge products like courses or SaaS or whatever, mm -hmm. that seems more interesting to me. Yeah. It, it's mostly um, just like a time plus like cost of reproduction, right? Like to redo the course would probably take way more time. Redoing a SaaS product would take way less time, but it still just becomes an equation of like volume equals, so outcome equals like volume times leverage. Yeah. Yeah. Way more leverage, like any kind of product like that. So I don't see myself doing it. Plus I think I will run out of shit to say and I'll get bored because I've reached some equilibrium where I'm giving the same advice over and over again in different, but with tweaks to different industries and different products. And at some point I just need to write it down like evals. I need to really <laughs> dig deep and think and have a system where people can do evals, but I shouldn't have to repeat it. Yeah, I should yeah. get to the place where I like, look, you don't need consulting. Just read this or go take this training. It's cheaper for you. It's going to give it's high quality. Just do that. Yeah. That makes sense. It's also a matter of like consulting work because indie consulting works. I, I think the McKinsey consulting works very differently. Like I'm, mm. I'm more convinced that like the McKinsey consultant is just a scapegoat for bad decisions, which is why they get paid so much because they're being paid a percentage of a hundred million dollar decision. But at least with like independent consulting, really, it's like you are a technical IC or a senior engineer and you're here and most companies are here. So your value is that gap. But the issue is that gap is limited when you like three years from now, I hopefully, if you've done a good job educating the public, the gap is smaller. I think that's a good comment to talk about. So that's the edges, right? Yeah. I get really frustrated when I can't blame myself. I feel trapped. <laughs> I'm serious. Like I feel trapped. And so I just feel like I can't, it's like hard for me to operate. Yeah, totally. It's just a... but, but again, that's why I think I'm more and more convinced that your compensation is purely a function of how accountable you are for the outcome of a business. Now I understand, like now I believe that people should be paid differently as a function of their risk and their responsibility. So I have employees now, I pay them, this is great. But if they fuck up, it's still my fault, right? If things are late, it's my fault. And it's like, if I could offload the responsibility of it being my fault, I would be willing to pay more because I would have to spend less effort and do less. It's also been a very weird realization having been in IC for such a long time. Yeah, I think people, too often people just sell a task list and the more other people sell me task lists versus outcomes, the more I'm just like, oh man, like, why can't you just take it to the finish line? Like, why do I have to glue oh, yeah. six people together and like, 40 emails and like 20 Slack messages, right? Why can't you just let me when the thing is like ready for sale? And then you realize, oh, this is why. Because at the, at the highest level of a employer-employee relationship is just a partner. And if it's a partner, it's just like some equity split of the business. Like, okay, that's the abstraction we got to think about. Okay, so what do you see? What, what happens in like three years? This is the question I've been asking everybody now. Like in three years, we're like reminiscing on like how incredible this AI wave has happened. Like what, what do you talk about? Like where do I, where would I love to be in three years? No, if what, what would you reminisce on in, in three years from now? The year is 2028. We get coffee and we're like, man, like 2024, that whole like chat GVD thing was crazy. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm sure we're talking about the course and like the success of learning by education. Maybe we're talking about like you have having launched a SaaS business or something. What I'm really excited about is I have a theory that it's easier than ever to be an indie hacker and have your own SaaS with just mm. one founder, two founders or whatever, like a team of the levels. one to three people. What I'm really excited about is this AI skill set, like ML, data scientists, whatever. Like it was too much. It was like way too much service area to span all the way from ML data, all the way to like front end engineering and making application engineering and all that shit. It's just like way too much. Like there's some people that can do it all of it, of course, but like mm -hmm. most people is too much, but I feel like there is a wave of things happening that might like allow you allow all of us people like me and you, especially to do that. 
and maybe that's like exciting because we understand AI really well. Mm -hmm. And then maybe it's, we can make applications that we can sell like little, yeah, like micro we can make product products. Yeah. We can do like micro SaaS, micro, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I think that's super exciting. I know that makes personally. sense. It's like really, I think the number that's going to go up is just like economic productivity per like you person. Right. Where if you look at Facebook, I think it's still like millions per employee. Like okay. Enterprise value per employee is just going to like asymptotically increase. If you look at a PWC. Oh, it's like market capitalization? Yeah. Like market capital, like revenue per head, not even revenue. Just, I think like market cap, right? Okay. Where I think like that number per head is just going to be very high. Like for PWC, it's like less than $200,000. For like, yeah. for Meta, it's, if you told me it was 2 million, I would still be surprised. It's probably pretty high. I don't know what I mean, it is. But it's probably it's, it's definitely probably not two hundred thousand because that doesn't. It's not two. Sense. Yeah, it's not two hundred thousand. But you um, know, I think as independent consultants, like we can probably easily do one million per head, right? And so it's wow. As an individual doing the worst, most unscalable business possible, our multiple is a million per head revenue. Yeah. So the so so the, the that said, both of our businesses have no enterprise value, but. Yeah. Then it's like, yeah, it would have, if you had like a very consistent amount of revenue for three years or so, then it would have some, it would, you would have some, and you had good accounting, good records, then all of a yeah, sudden you could I sell your consulting business. The only business I can create that would have enterprise value as a consultant would be if I spun out a DevRel agency. Where the output oh, people need that so much. Right. And then I just teach like Joe and Ivan, for example, to run this thing and there's enterprise value in the business. But for us, it's if we die, the business never makes money again. Like, Oh yeah, that's true. Like, yeah. I need permission yeah. to die is what I think about. Well, the dying thing, that's the case with many businesses, like even large, there's, if there's the right person dies, the whole thing is going to die. Yeah, but like, like if like, Zuck dies, I think it, he could have died like a long time ago. Yeah, but I think it would have been fine, right? That's what I mean. I think the re this is the thing I, I spoke to you about YouTubers a lot. Is YouTubers are really trying to make sure they invert their business model. Because right now, all the YouTubers, it's like this inverted triangle where like the YouTuber is the face of the business. And then everything, like their editors, their content creators, their writers all rest on the, his, their shoulders. And so the YouTuber wants to stop doing YouTube. They basically destroy the economic value of the business because the editors are all out of jobs. A lot of YouTubers are trying to invert their business model where they're the CEO of a business, but they're not responsible for the life of the business. I think we're, we're right now closer to the YouTuber than the CEO. Mm. Makes sense. Like making, a lot of YouTubers now have like merchandising companies and like production studios where they help other YouTubers. And so if they ever stop YouTube, that other company can absorb all their like headcount. So no one like loses their job. Very interesting conversations on like content creation because we're like content creators in some weird way. Yeah. And even the course, it's hard to think about the course because I think the more you take your hands off of it, the more the quality drops. Right. But even for the course, there's no way I like can upload 20 videos and have them be relevant in three years. Right. So like the asset depreciates too quickly, which is like a weather app. Like everyone needs to check the weather always. Like that, if you saw like a, a weather app that sells the app for like $2 a, a year, it's probably going to make more money than. Both of us combined. For sure. Yeah. So what are you, if I flip the, that same question on you, what would you say? What would I talk about? I would mostly talk about how much I learned about what a business looks like. Like all of this is super fascinating because I really like trying to recover all the principles from like first principles and like just understanding that information has been very interesting. That said, if you go and say, okay, what do you mean by that? What is the understanding of what a business looks like? Like why marketing is important and like the value of doing okay. sales, understanding like what the levers are. It's like my only advice to people now is to meet people. Like it, it's so stupid that like from first principles, I've realized that I should have like made more friends in college. You know what I mean? Because what you realize is, oh, at, like you start trading your labor and then you like ask people for help and you tell people what to do and then you find people who can hire people. Then you, you're the reason people join the company. And then you like allocate capital. If your goal is to transcend that hierarchy, the limiting factor is not the capital because capital has like zero marginal costs in terms of access and reproduction, right? And it's probably easier to ask for $10 million than like $80,000 because people who can give $10 million, that 10 million becomes just a small percentage of their total net worth that like weird economics happen. And so all the limiting factor of any business is just the talent asset class. And so now it's like, okay, the reason you like, 
you should meet more people. Is, okay, if you want to run a business, your only job is hiring. If people from Waterloo are like, okay, what advice do you have for someone who wants to do anything? It's like, just, just meet great people and understand what motivates them. Know who you're going to call when you have problems because you will never be able to do everything yourself. Just to ask others for help, understand what motivates them. And I mean, about being lonely, it's just a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah. But it's like before, it's like, oh, I want to be the, like, the best. I want to have like great ideas. Like, oh, no, no, no one gives a shit. The moment you have good it, ideas, yeah. the next thing is who can I bring in to help me make this thing? And so if you go backwards, the most important thing is actually knowing people. Once you have all that, like, once you have like, a talent asset class, which is the hardest asset class, getting money and having good ideas is like the cheapest thing possible. I guess this seems fine. This seems enough people. And it's fine. It's fine. It's still hard. It it... We're talking about like how, how hard it is to find like an EA. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. That's true. Getting people to work for you is like separate because it's like I can barely convince myself to work for myself. Like I'm barely motivated, right? This is why I consult. <laughs> no one can convince me to work for them. And I think it's because I don't really understand like what my motivations are for working anymore. Like it's not money. Like money is just evidence that my, my ideas are right. Let's say if I was going to charge for the book, it's purely on principle that I have to believe in like value pricing. You know, it doesn't matter how much I charge because it's going to be valuable. If I just made it free, I think people just wouldn't take it seriously. But now, no, no, like, you have to charge for it. You get a signal. You you lose the signal that's very valuable, and it's right. like and the signal is like actually yeah. I, I like the it, course, for example, gave me some a lot of signal, like on what people cared about when I was launching it, and allowed me to change the whole course, like right. completely. This is basically what YC says, right? Like, charger, you have to charge people because for sure, yeah. Because the moment someone pays you, the most valuable thing that they gave you is their time. It's like fucking hilarious. It's like, damn, I feel like all these business advice bullshit. I, I finally figured it out. I'm like I, I like finally believe it. But I wish I could just believe it off the bat. Yeah, related. Be a talent magnet. So what do you think about this comment? Doing yourself is lonely. Ask others for help. Sounds like levels antithesis. Yeah, I was thinking about that, and I was. Did you watch the the lecture? Yes, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a it, well, I think it's a, it's a really cool uh, interview. One because like I aspire to be an indie hacker, like I said earlier, but mm -hmm. like also it's like an interesting, I think it's interesting that he interviewed him. Like it's a different kind of persona, I think, than mm -hmm. what he usually interviews. And it's pretty cool. But yeah, he did specifically say he doesn't like hiring people, maybe some contractors here and there. He talked mm -hmm. about one TikTok guy that he gave like $4,000 to because this TikTok guy brought him like $20,000 of sign up. Mm -hmm. So he's like, whatever, just whatever. Yeah, make it, no, um, I'm it MRR. And so that is contrasted with something from this business coach that you told me about that I read about Alex Ramosi. And mm -hmm. one thing that, that Alex Ramosi says is like hiring people is really difficult, but it is the core of business. That is business. So like you need to get over it and just do it. If you can't do that, then don't do business. If you want to grow your business in any meaningful way and stop doing everything yourself, like you need to hire people. But it is hard and is painful as hell. Yeah. But that is the reason that that people that make a lot of money are able to hire people because it's it's hard. It's the filter that it's like one of the big filters that allow you to move past. It's like the gate. So I think it's cool that it's the gate. I'm like, okay, that's a problem that you can solve. Yeah, I noticed like when I was like in 18 years old, I had a bunch of friends be like CEO fellows and they all started companies and I haven't seen them in a long time because I left tech for, you know, a couple of years. And what I realized is just, yeah, all the really great founders I know who were founders when they were in like 18 and now they're like in their thirties, almost everyone we talk about, they know their like strengths and weaknesses. Like, oh, you know, this person, I try to hire him to run my marketing team. Great guy. Like, oh, this person, like I wanted to hire her for my growth team. It's like the conversations they have are all around like, because the, the stuff to do will be done by the people. I don't know. It, it's just silly that we're social animals and we, we group together to make cities and do agriculture and do all this. And yet we're like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do everything myself. It's the biggest unlocked. It's the biggest, like just having an EA is oh. the most amazing thing ever. Like it took me a while to learn how to even like delegate properly. <laughs> Yeah. Because even that is a skill. But like now that I've done it, it's like completely changed my entire life. Because I'm not doing a whole set of activities. Like I'm not doing those anymore. Yeah. No, it's so true. And you're like, oh, again, this is why. Yeah. You know, you like you first pay people to do what you don't want to do. 
Then you'd be able to do what you're like, okay. And then you start to find people who do what you're like, good at. Damn. My only job is to just find the people to do the stuff. And if you want to be the ideas person, your like core skill is just, because for me, I don't really care about doing nothing. For me, I like being right. I like, I like being right more than I like to win, which is why I'm not doing a VC bad company. And I, w- I want to be known for having like great ideas. And you realize, oh man, if that is actually who I want to be, my, the thing I need to figure out is hiring. Because no incredible idea is like a one person job. Like every, like they might get the fame of it. Like Steve Jobs didn't fucking make the iPhone. <laughs> the greatest people in the world wanted to work with Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. And probably because they were like, oh, I want a slice of the pie. And then Jobs was like, great. I want you to have a slice of the pie because this is a good fucking idea. And then you realize, oh, like even in the value-based pricing, I want to do value-based pricing when I'm uncertain of my own confidence to deliver economic value. But if I know something's going to make a lot of money, that's when I choose to do labor. <laughs> What's really interesting about value-based pricing is that what's, that's what sales is. The activity of a sales is like meta. Like you are allocating your time according and like spending it in a way that's yeah. aligned with some value. But like the best businesses are like, yeah, like real estate. It's all, you're just taking percentages. It's, and founders do that for founding engineers. Like this 1% is so uninteresting now. So I think founder engineers should get like 5%. If they're really going to be found, like, otherwise just hire them as an engineer. Yeah. It's, I'm very surprised at it. I, I just like, we changed like everything I think about like, value and pricing. It's like, it really changes your brain chemistry. I should probably go, but it, it was really cool catching up. Dude, it's crazy. There's yeah. 1700 viewers right now off Twitter. Just Twitter. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. 13 from YouTube and like 1,608 from Twitter. Anyways. All right. Let's sign off. Thanks for jumping on today. And thanks for everyone uh, watching at home. Hope this was entertaining and uh, yeah, DM us if you have any uh, questions or just like, leave a comment in the thread. Awesome. Take care, man.